Um, so uh, thanks for the invitation. I think there were lots and lots of uh, amazing questions earlier on in the session. I think uh, problems with people in cardiogenic shock is uh, coming back, and I think uh, our reality in Canada is a little bit different in terms of you know uh, listing criteria and the finances behind uh, um, the strategies. But in the end, I think the ultimate strategy is to get the patient out of trouble into some kind of a physiological uh, health that whether he's on a destination therapy path or a transplant path or a recovery path, I think bottom line, we don't want the patient to have uh, the best possible outcome. Um, this is our uh, cardiac center that's being under construction. I think uh, Michel Carrier is a pivotal member of our, of our surgical team. Uh, and even though he keeps uh, saying that as a cardiologist, I send people that are uh, almost dead to his, uh, to his OR, I kind of usually say, well, they're still a little bit alive. So, and that's kind of the part that we have to try to save, but as the questions were and the, the, uh, the comments were earlier on, I think we have to put, if we are going for transplant, we have to make sure the patient has the best possible transplant outcome and not just transplant the sickest people, which are typically highly prioritized. So I think that's one of the roles that may be properly uh, selecting uh, patients uh, and having a op appropriate strategy is the best way to do it. Um, you know, the Intermax ones and twos, I think we learned a lot from Intermax that uh, heart made uh, twos and threes, probably not the best idea to put them in in a, in a crashing, burning patient. And I think that's unfortunately kind of what uh, uh, the reputation the, the uh, Cardio West had in our institution back a number of years ago, where it was kind of the last ditch resort. Uh, and if you're going to get a Cardio West, it's because everything's been tried and you're just about to die. And therefore, you know, you have to expect bad results with a sick patient. Uh, and I think part of the strategy is to be able to use a device that works. I mean, develops blood pressure, develops cardiac output. Uh, if it's installed properly, you can have minimal surgical complications. But you have to put the right device in the right patient. Otherwise, uh, just like with uh, ECMOs and tandem hearts and impellas and, 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 um, and heart mate twos and threes, if you put a wor good working device in, a, in the wrong patient, you're going to have poor results. So we all know about cardiogenic shock, and there's a fair amount of patients that get into biventricular shock or other complications or other pathologies that we'll sort of mention. And I think it's important to realize that, you know, VA ECMO is part of today's reality, and whether, you know, we should be uh, bridging people uh, to transplant with, uh, uh, with ECMO uh, for those who can't recover and for those who uh, are probably not transplant eligible because they're too sick. Uh, I think we're kind of stuck with trying to find some way to get them to or select out who should go for a durable mechanical support. But that's part of our reality. And as we know that over the course of the past just few years, uh, the numbers have exploded worldwide. So in terms of cardiac arrest in our ECPR program, our numbers as well have gone up dramatically. In terms of patients in uh, critical cardiogenic shock as well, they're increasing. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of these patients end up dying from multi-organ failure, uh, or we end up withdrawing. Uh, sorry, I'm going to go back. Uh, one slide. And we end up withdrawing a lot of these, uh, these patients from, uh, from support because they, they're just too sick or there's a bridge to nothing, right? So uh, no cardiac recovery possible. Uh, they need a bridge to something or death. I mean, if this is their final attempt at, at life and it doesn't work, I think it's reasonable to stop if you realize you have no uh, possible destination uh, or transplant. And you're going to have some of these patients that you put an ECMO in or they show up on ECMO uh, Monday morning in your unit and you're sort of like, well, okay, well, what the, what's the plan, right? I mean, it's not working, it's not recovering. So if they don't have an LVAD or an immediate transplant uh, option, I think this is potentially where if we have a quick uh, assessment strategy for the total artificial heart, uh, you know, we can use it appropriately in the right patients to get them better. And I think a lot of our strategies in terms of either just continuum with a blasting with inotropes or, uh, or temporary percutaneous support devices, it kind of keeps them alive, but doesn't necessarily allow the patient to recover. You know, if they're strapped in in bed and uh, they're not moving and they get pneumonias uh, uh, and they have all the consequences of catecholamines, I think, you know, it's clearly not going to allow us to have any type of good outcome whether this patient's transplanted or not. And I think the cardiogenic shock has this kind of evolution of, you know, initially sort of a ischemic organ injury from the cardiogenic aspect, and then you have the systemic in inflammatory response syndrome that adds up. And then the longer you stay in the ICU intubated with lines, well, this whole sep sepsis uh, uh, goes up every day with a, typically around sort of a 6 to 8% uh, complication rate per day. So I think that, you know, your patient at the beginning is super sick and your patient at the very end might be even sicker. So I think we have to find some kind of opportunity in the middle or at least have some kind of a red flag that tells us, okay, as of day X or as of this situation or these labs, we have to decide 
what's our bailout strategy, even though bailout is probably a bad word, because I think this was talking about sort of the uh, last option. But if your patient is on ECMO, I think we have to have some kind of a bridge to, uh, to bridge. So some of the typical cases that we've done uh, just recently with our with uh, syncardia total artificial heart. So uh, patient, uh, huge MI, uh, 43 years old, uh, some cocaine use, incessant VT. I mean, they tried ablating her, but it's just impossible. So uh, clearly not a good uh, LVAD candidate and for other criteria, non-transplantable at that time. Post-infarction VSD, like a huge VSD, you're literally from base to apex uh, in, a, in a huge male. Uh, humeral rejection, a patient who was transplanted a number of years ago who was getting to sort of like a restrictive physiology with worsening cardiorenal syndrome. Severe biventricular dysfunction where the RV was essentially akinetic, so clearly not a good uh, LVAD candidate, and he was a big guy, so transplant was not an option as well uh, at that point, even though he was getting worse. So I think we all have all these patients, and I think we have to be able to strategize uh, as to whom we could put uh, total, total artificial heart in and what's the best moment to do it. Um, whether on ECMO or they're heading towards some kind of temporary support, but we have to, we have to find a timeline to, uh, to discuss about this. So barriers to transplantation, I mean, that's, that's kind of the last resort, I think, in a lot of patients, but if we have to get there, we have to get there because the heart doesn't work anymore and we don't have a permanent solution as a mechanical device at this point. But I think we all fight with the fact that, you know, the patient is either too big or too tall, sensitization, uh, forgot about bl blood groups, but uh, group O is obviously a bad, uh, bad problem if you're listed. Instability, if he's getting worse or not getting better, uh, you might not be able to wait long enough to get a transplant. If he's already got multi-organ dysfunction uh, with a condition that's probably not eligible for LVAD therapy or some other bridge. Um, or we have patients that as well have just deemed not uh, transplant candidates because they're too sick, uh, even though, you know, total artificial heart could be their bridge to... Uh, to transplant, but they're just never even considered for transplant because they, nobody knows how to bring them there. And we don't have the same problems in the U.S. where there are many, many uh, ECMO and LVAD centers. You know, in Montreal, we're sort of, there's McGill and there's us in terms of uh, ECMO, LVAD, and transplant. So uh, typically, we're not going to get the crashing RV failure LVAD patient from another institution. Uh, if we put it in, well, that's kind of our mistake and our fault, and we have to deal with it. Uh, but I think that uh, the, the cases of the failing RV uh, in the LVAD patient, uh, potentially for a total fish heart, is an excellent uh, patient population as well. From all the uh, literature in management of cardiogenic shock, I think it's, you know, the hopes are for some kind of recovery or palliation, uh, and there's lots of discussion to just say, okay, well, if that doesn't work, then just go for a durable VAD. But there's very little information to tell us, you know, okay, who to select and when to select. We always know that earlier is better, like for any other type of uh, support device in shock. Uh, but I think if we can include, you know, LVADs and total fissure hearts with specific timeline uh, in a strategy, uh, then we can get to the right patient at the right time. Important data sort of allows us to sort of help understand, so patients that are already on ECMO, they'll show up at your institution or this put in the cath lab, uh, and then you're in your ICU, you have to sort of realize that most of the mortality happens up front. So typically these are patients that were already in shock for a number of hours, or they had other some kind of a secondary medical problem that put them into uh, cardiogenic shock. Uh, and then most of the deaths happen early, typically within the first three to four days. So there's an, just a biological triage of patients that are not going to survive, and you can sort of eliminate them from, uh, uh, from your roster. Um, and most of those deaths will be multi-organ failure. So typically what I sort of uh, you know, teach my residents is that you know, if you're on a support device that gives you know, five liters per minute of blood flow uh, and you die of multi-organ failure, you put in your vice too late. And clearly there's an accumulated injury that you know, uh, the patient dies from. So, you know, if the patient dies and you can select them out, clearly these are not patients that you'd want to uh, either list for transplant or uh, put other, sub other devices into because they're probably not going to do either way. And that's sort of where the bad outcomes come from uh, in terms of people that have been on ECMO at some point is a lot of them do get some kind of a huge metabolic hit that allows them to recover somewhat, but they're still going to be very, very sick uh, no matter what you do, even if you get them to transplant after a certain number of days or even weeks on, on ECMO. We try to uh, sort of triage a little bit of a few of our patients that come in in shock to not put people on ECMO that we know may not survive. So the SAVE score is one of these ways that something, sometimes in the cath lab or in the emergency room we use to sort of say, well, you know, we're not going to put this guy in ECMO because no matter what we do, uh, you know, this corroborates the fact that he's going to have a poor outcome anyways. So we try to use this as, as part of our triage up front, not to end up with you know, six people on ECMO uh, and no uh, destination. 
The other thing is that there's a potential favorable uh, profile of patients that uh, within four to 10 days, I think it's been brought up a couple of times already, um, where there's clearly an improved hemometabolic state, organ function can recover because you re returned blood flow and oxygenation to the tissue. Uh, you had already a couple of days to, you know, weed out the, the non-survivors. You have a few days to assess whether they're a bridge to recovery or a bridge to bridge or a bridge to transplant. Uh, and this is obviously before sort of the day 10 and 12 and upward where you start to have all the complications of uh, infection, deconditioning, catecholine toxicity, uh, cachexia, and so on and so on. So there's probably some kind of window opportunity sort of here between day 4 and 10 where I think we have to really get on the ball and say, this is probably the best condition we might get our patient in if we want to move to another type of strategy. And this is just a graph saying that, you know, uh, infection-free survival over the days of ECMO, uh, well, it typically it's about 6 to 6% 6 per day infection rate. So the longer you wait, the, the greater the chance your patient's going to inf get infected, no matter what we do, you know, VAP bundles, uh, you know, dressing changes, this and that. So I think we have to you know, avoid getting into this two or three or four week ECMO patient who's going to have the pneumonia, who's going to have the line infection, who's going to have the, the bed sore, who's going to have the cellulitis, uh, because that's not going to help uh, outcome at all. So one of the things that I found really uh, important when I present about cardiogenic shock in general is that the Detroit Shock Initiative was one of the first uh, sort of algorithms that standardized an approach for patients in shock. Uh, and they've so far demonstrated a reduction in their shock mortality quite dramatically. I mean, one of the first times in, uh, in the number of decades we've been trying to manage cardiogenic shock. Uh, and part of which is, you know, it's a strategy. It's like the patient comes in, right away, boom, we get numbers, we get a strategy, device or no device. Uh, so that's one of the aspects, so I think, the success. You standardize and approach the patients uh, in shock. The second element, which I believe is, is important as well, uh, is that the point is sort of wean them off all these catecholamines, vasopressors, and inotropes. Because, you know, there's mounting evidence showing that minimizing catecholamines uh, and optimizing perfusion reduces secondary injury, reduces all these catabolic effects, reduces the risk of arrhythmias, uh, there's immunomodulatory effects of high-dose catecholamines. So, you know, a patient who's got a map of 65 on three drugs is not a stable patient and he's not going to do as well as a patient who's got no inotropes with a pump that's actually working to develop adequate cardiac output. So I think this is a huge aspect of the improved survival uh, by trying to get them off all this rocket fuel which is causing secondary injury and which is what we could potentially achieve with a total, total artificial heart in a biventricular patient uh, by getting off all these uh, catecholamines. If you look at the physiotherapy sort of recovery uh, aspects of uh, total official heart, I mean, the whole point is, you know, you're trying to avoid this prolonged immobilization phase, which has cardiovascular, respiratory, neuromuscular, and other side effects that leads to sort of your chronic, debilitated patient uh, who's at risk of every single complication in the book. So leaving your patient on ECMO bed bound with femoral cannulation for X number of weeks uh, is clearly not the best strategy. Uh, and as Michel Carrier pushes all, uh, very often in our center, he's like, you know, if I'm going to transplant this guy, I want him sitting up, I want him walking, I want him with physiotherapy, I want him to eat by himself, because if he's bed-bound, then clearly that's not going to be a good outcome, even though he's the most urgent patient in the hospital to get a transplant. So this is some of the data that shows that there's this survival benefit. So there's the highest survival you could potentially have in a patient that comes in critical cardiogenic shock on ECMO uh, is typically sort of within the first uh, uh, four days to 10 days. Uh, at the beginning of which you know that the mortality is high because you weed out all the patients that got their device too late and they're dying of multi-organ failure. And then following that, survival goes down because either you have secondary infections, secondary complications, uh, or you just have a patient who just doesn't, cannot be weaned off their device, that not deemed a transplant candidate because of poor RV function or otherwise, uh, and then you just stop the therapies. But I think there's a, there's a moment here where we can sort of grasp this population with the best possible outcome. And if you could transition them to a patient who's getting out of bed, who has uh, implantable BIV support, uh, you know, that might maximize the patient population at that point. So these are the two high-risk zones that you're trying to avoid, and this is the, the area that you're, that you're going to try to optimize and identify your patient, and maybe take a decision uh, to implant something at this point as a bridge-to-bridge. -bridge. There are various algorithms in terms of sort of how they uh, decide to remove uh, their ECMO or uh, their support devices, but obviously, you know, for the persistent RV, LV dysfunctions and a whole bunch of other diagnoses we got into at the beginning, I think, you know, the BIVADs or the total official hearts do have a role in trying to get these patients that are not LVAD or recovery candidates. 
We know that the earlier you put in your support devices, the better. If you know late implantation on ECMO, you're not going to do as well because of everything we mentioned before. So you want to get them early enough, but not too early, that they're still going to die of multi-organ failure and be able to tolerate the surgery. So clinical case one, delay with incessant VT. I mean, she's already on ECMO. At this point, she's LVAN and ineligible for, uh, because of the arrhythmias, and we know that just, that just doesn't work. You know, she, she weighs uh, quite a bit. She's a big woman. She's got some sensitization because of prior childbirth. So she's not going to get transplanted anytime soon. So uh, Catherine sort of uh, put together these, uh, these fantastic algorithms, which I think are very similar to sort of, you know, early goal-directed therapies in sepsis to uh, the Detroit Heart Initiative uh, uh, algorithms for implantation of uh, temporary LV support devices uh, in cardiogenic shock and acute MI. But I think the point of a lot of these algorithms is that you identify a category of diagnosis we know are not going to do well anyway. Uh, you try to manage the patient as best you can on current uh, medical and technology. Uh, you have to be able to identify your, your, your possible outcomes. You know, can he go for transplant? Uh, can he um, get an LVAD? Uh, can he get a total artificial heart? And then you identify within four days. I think as soon as early four days on, on ECMO, you have to be able to say, okay, he's not improving or he's dead. And then you have to move on right away and sort of implant uh, your total artificial heart in this population to get all the benefits uh, without any of the complications. Similarly to our clinical case two, post-VSD, huge guy, uh, huge VSD that's non-operable, multi-organ failure, stabilized for about 10 days. Uh, you know, he can be listed, but how long is he gonna wait? Uh, again, same thing, evidence-based management. Make sure you raise the question of total artificial heart early, because when these patients have a poor outcome, just leaving them on ECMO, and he's not gonna get transplanted for a, probably a good number of weeks, uh, even in, in Montreal at uh, status one, which is their most urgent. Patient with acute humeral ejection, one of my patients who had uh, worsening bi failure and cardiorenal syndrome, we tried some desensitization with a plasmapheresis uh, and rituximab, uh, which probably didn't work, probably went down by 1%, but kind of essentially useless. Uh, no LVAD or ECMO option, because we you know these options don't work at this point. Uh, it was either to let her die 42 years or try a total official heart, which is what she ended up getting uh, in her strategy, which again, was decided fairly quickly uh, once we felt that she was getting a lot worse uh, with potentially with the good outcome because of everything we have here. Clinical case four, severe biventricular failure, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, we had a couple of patients uh, in the spring, one of which ended up on ECMO, one of which didn't end up on ECMO. We just sent them for total arterial heart early on. Again, all the typical criteria that it's not gonna get them transplanted anytime soon, even though he's an Intermax two uh, and sliding fast. So the total artificial heart option became, uh, became very uh, advantageous as early as we could decide. Uh, and Michel Carrier is fantastic at that. It's sort of as soon as we braise the idea, he says, okay, fine, I'll do it tomorrow morning. So I mean, he sort of cuts to the chase and I think that's probably one of the, uh, the best ways at, uh, at managing these situations before they get out of hand or they fester on the floor for, for too long. So ideally what we're trying to do is transform a patient like this who's on ECMO with a balloon pump, multiple catecholamines, who could be there for one, two, three, four weeks, losing muscle mass. And a lot of the physiotherapists actually say, you know, time is muscle. And then the longer you stay in bed, you're not moving. Well, this patient is going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. Uh, patients that have central ECMO, the same thing. I mean, there's no way that this guy with an open chest or central ECMO is going to do well for more than a week or two or three. He's going to get every complication in the book, uh, knowing that he's not going to recover from this. And what we try to avoid, you know, is the patient who survives uh, but, you know, versus the patient who thrives. And I think the examples we had recently of all our patients that we got to total, total artificial heart fairly soon is that these are people, they were out of bed, they were walking, they were recovering, their creatinines normalized in a few of them, uh, better quality of life, and they're clearly better transplant candidates uh, at that point uh, than the patient in the previous picture. So I think that, uh, you know, the conclusions are strategy is going to be key for the total artificial heart. I think there's two conversations to be had, one of which is in the ECMO population, which is kind of just a la mode, and we're going to have to deal with these patients whether we like it or not, is to decide fairly early within the first four days to a week, you know, this is where we're going to go if we can't get them transplanted as your highest priority, uh, or if they're still too sick, and even if they get the best possible heart, they're not going to have a good outcome. Uh, versus, you know, the sort of the chronic decompensating patient, like the LVADs. We learned a lot, stay away from the Intermax 1s and 2s. You know, should some of our patients go straight to 
total artificial heart uh, from home or who've been hospitalized once or twice because we know they're not going to be uh, transplanted easily like the, the restrictive cardiomyopathies or, or so on. Uh, but I think this is, you know, I don't have as much experience with all the total artificial hearts as you guys, so I think this is clearly open for discussion to try to define what's the best way to sort of have a strategy that'll keep this idea circulating as soon as you see a patient on ECMO. You know, should this be an automatic advanced heart failure consult for LVAD or transplant or total artificial heart as soon as on ECMO? I think we have to raise that question right up front. So uh, any comments or, or suggestions? And, it, and it's sad that, you know, like in our institute too, I mean, the, the cardio West has been associated with, you know, refractory shock, let's try something else. But uh, ideally, the less sick the patient, the better the outcomes. Yeah, the, the DH, like I mentioned before, is not uh, a device to resuscitate people. That's right. I mean, you can improve the patient, but, uh, yeah. Patient undergoing CPR, as was er mentioned earlier, if you're taking the patient at the OR under CPR, it's not going to work uh, on what we see.